2012, researchers in Alaska began to notice a number of trees popping up from under a melting glacier. Many in their original upright position and some still bearing roots and even bark. These trees were part of an ancient forest that had been covered up by the Mendenhall Glacier for more than 1,000 years. It's normal for glaciers to melt to some extent in summer, and at first, this story sounds pretty cool, until you start to think about why the Mendenhall Glacier is melting so much and what the consequences of this might be. Glaciers are regions of freshwater ice that have formed on land. They are also just one type of ice around the world that is melting at an unprecedented rate as a result of man-made climate change. But for the next few years at least, melting glaciers in the Arctic region are probably not going to be our biggest concern. More worrying is the Arctic sea ice that is disappearing at an alarming rate. For the past 800,000 years, there has always been some ice in the Arctic Ocean, even in the summer where much of it melts. But a computer climate model by the National Centre for Atmospheric Research predicts that by 2040, the Arctic could be completely ice-free during late summer. And worryingly, other predictions have even suggested that it could be ice-free at some point of the year by 2016. In fact, the situation is so bad that many climate scientists have referred to it as the death spiral. So why is it so disastrous? Melting sea ice itself doesn't actually add to sea levels because it has already taken up space in the ocean. If you fancy it, we've heard you can test this out at home with ice cubes and a glass of water. But anyway, less sea ice means that less sunlight gets reflected back off the Earth, which means a warmer Arctic. And this, in turn, is melting nearby land ice, such as the Greenland Ice Sheet, which is causing sea levels to rise. And the Ilulissat Glacier in Greenland, seen here in the documentary Chasing Ice. shows the Ilulissat Glacier breaking up, what is known as carving in the ice world, and retreating a full mile. Because areas of ice are often too huge for us to comprehend with just our eyes, they are often referred to in units of Manhattans, as in the island of Manhattan in New York. But back to the Arctic's floating sea ice. It's also thought that when sea ice melts, it releases methane gas that has been trapped in air bubbles in the ice and that this could also accelerate climate change. In October 2012, the leading climate scientist, Michael Mann, said that rising sea levels coupled with extreme weather could lead to some island nations having to evacuate within this decade. And this includes the tiny island of Tuvalu, which has already asked Australia and New Zealand to accept its 11,000 citizens. So far, neither country has accepted. It also includes the Maldives, the Seychelles, Kiribati, the Torres Strait Islands, the Solomon Islands, Micronesia, Palau, and the Carteret Islands. And then there's Tegua, which is part of the Pacific island chain of Vanuatu. In December 2005, the United Nations called Tegua's residents the first climate change refugees. But it's not just islands that are at risk. Bangladesh, which is home to 156 million people, could also find itself underwater in the next few years.
And that's not all. Nearly all the marine wildlife in the Arctic is dependent on sea ice for some parts of its life cycle, while the melting ice poses a serious danger for the Arctic's indigenous people who travel about on the ice when hunting. And as the sea ice melts, it's also exposing reserves of fossil fuels, the very stuff that's caused the ice to melt in the first place. In fact, one study published in 2009 concluded that as much as 30% of the world's undiscovered gas and 13% of the world's undiscovered oil may be found in the Arctic, mostly offshore. 90 billion barrels of accessible oil alone are thought to lie under the Arctic seafloor. And if all of this was consumed, it would result in 27 billion tonnes of carbon dioxide, the gas responsible for climate change, being emitted into the atmosphere. As of yet, however, no oil or gas has actually been pumped from the Arctic seafloor, but already the region's become a battleground for governments, energy companies and environmentalists. This map shows the seven areas where most of the Arctic region's oil and gas reserves are believed to be located. As you can see, six countries border the Arctic Ocean. Canada, Iceland, Norway, Russia, the United States and Denmark via Greenland. This means they all have a legal claim to portions of the Arctic seafloor. Several major energy companies have already signed deals with these countries to begin oil and gas exploration in the Arctic including Shell, Rosneft, Khan Energy, Chevron, ExxonMobil and Gazprom, to name just a few. And some have already got stuck in. But signing deals is really the easy thing for the energy companies. It's what comes next that's the hard part. For starters, drilling in the Arctic costs a lot of money. In 2012, the Russian state news agency, RIA Novosti, announced it was cheaper to send a rocket into space than to drill a single oil well in the Arctic Ocean. This was based on estimates that put one offshore oil well in the Arctic somewhere between $100 and $150 million. But if an energy company goes for the deluxe option of having an Arctic drilling platform, that could set them back between $5 and $6 billion. One person put off by this is Leonid Fedin, vice president of Russia's second biggest oil company, Lukoil. In a 2013 interview with the Financial Times, Fedin reportedly said he wouldn't give a kopeck towards Arctic oil exploration because the risks associated with drilling the Arctic seabed are far too high. The environmental NGO Greenpeace believes that the combination of freezing temperatures, remote location and the narrow window in which energy companies have to drill before the melting sea ice freezes again during winter would make an oil spill in the Arctic almost impossible to deal with. It's called it a catastrophe waiting to happen. And Greenpeace aren't the only ones concerned. In March 2013, Greenland put a halt to all new drilling licences, while four months later, the UK's Environmental Audit Committee said oil companies had been unable to prove they could clean up an oil spill in such harsh conditions. You only need to look at the story of the energy company Shell to understand the potential pitfalls of offshore drilling in the Arctic. Shell first obtained licenses to explore the Arctic Ocean off the coast of Alaska back in 2005. And after spending a whopping $4.5 billion, it eventually began exploration in the summer of 2012. But by 2013, Shell had already decided to suspend operations and was later barred from drilling in the Arctic by the US government, unless a major overhaul of its operations took place. followed a series of disasters for Shell, including multiple safety violations, a fire on board a rig, the interruption of a major ice flow, and perhaps the final nail in the coffin. In December 2012, a Shell vessel carrying 139,000 gallons of diesel and 12,000 gallons of chemicals ran aground in Alaska. We're about to demonstrate a controlled well blowout using this, a scale model of the actual Kolak drill rig. Blow that well.
cap it. Clean it. Following all this, Greenpeace launched an elaborate online campaign against Shell that included spoof YouTube videos and a hoax website with the domain arcticready.com. In the summer of 2013, Greenpeace stepped up its action against drilling the Arctic and sent two ships to the region to, as they put it, head off a new Arctic oil rush. The Esperanza headed to Alaska, while the Arctic Sunrise took in Norway and Russia, experiencing some run-ins with the Russian authorities along the way. On one occasion, Russian coast guards boarded the Arctic Sunrise and told the activists that if they failed to leave the area, Swift measures would be taken. And then, when some of the activists scaled an oil drilling platform belonging to the energy company Gazprom, armed members of the Russian military stormed the Arctic Sunrise, rounded up those on board and arrested them. All 30 crew members are now being held in a pre-trial detention centre inside Russia and have all been refused bail. Greenpeace say that Gazprom, which is owned by the Russian government, plans to start pumping actual oil from the Arctic seafloor in 2014. You can let us know what you think about all of this by leaving us a comment and if you like this video, make sure you share it.